Our aim is to celebrate the sustaining grace of God for 125 years. And my first question is, what is that? What is sustaining grace? And I want to put it in a four-line poem that I took about an hour to figure out yesterday. And I'm going to say it over and over again because when I take the time to put things in a rhyme that is true, it just helps me. Helps me. So you have to tolerate this. <laughs> what is sustaining grace? Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this. The grace that orders our trouble and pain and then, in the darkness, is there to sustain. Now, the reason I stress this is because if we were to celebrate a grace this morning that bars us from what is not bliss, and that gives flight from all distress and that does not order our pain, it would be biblically false and experientially unrealistic. And I'm going to give you some illustrations, both from our church life and from the Bible, to show you that that is so. Our experience and the Bible teaches us that grace does not prevent pain, but orders it arranges it, measures it out, and then in the darkness of it, sustains us. For example, yesterday, Bob Ricker, I'm going to borrow your story. You go to him and get it corrected afterwards if I've missed anything. He told us in that other room over there that God ordains that the people of the Lord from time to time take stones and make memorials out of them so that when they look at them and children say, what's that? Parents and others can say, that's because God did that. And then he told the story of a little less than 10 years ago, their daughter was in a very serious automobile accident, so serious that she would have died. But the car behind, providentially, had a doctor in it. The doctor providentially had in his pocket did you say pocket or bag? I can't remember. An, an air tube. He also had the presence of mind and got to her just as she was turning blue to force this into her throat, and she lived. And he did her wedding here, a couple of, it was 892, I think you said. And as he looked at her doing the wedding as the pastor and saw these little scars that remain, he said to her, those are a memorial of sustaining grace. Now, Bob Ricker is not naive. He knows that if God can manage a doctor in the car behind, and if God can manage a little air tube in his pocket, if God can manage to put him on the scene with the presence of mind and the saving action to save her life, he could have stopped the accident in the first place. Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our trouble and pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain. Another story, a little lighter this time. Noel, Abraham, Barnabas, and Talitha are in the car two Saturdays ago, driving from here to Georgia. The car breaks down three times, and Daddy is at home, comfortable. <laughs> the third time it broke down was about an hour outside of Indianapolis on a lonely stretch Saturday afternoon, and the radiator crumbles to pieces, basically. Car overheats, they're off on the side of the road, baby, two kids, wife, and no Daddy, what do you do on Saturday afternoon? 
a farmer stops, 67-year-old farmer, and uh, says, can I help? And Noel says, well, we just need a motel and a Monday morning with a, a garage somewhere. Where are we? And he says, well, w- would you be willing to come stay with us, my wife and me? Pause. Um, well, I'm not sure we would want to impose. And he says, you know, the Lord says that when you serve people in need, it's like serving the Lord. And she says, well, can we go to church with you tomorrow morning? And he says, can you take a Baptist church? Not only is he a farmer, he is a retired aviation mechanic. (laughs) And he sets them up. Monday morning, he drives to Indianapolis at 6 a.m., buys the radiator, puts it in, will not charge her for the labor. And they're on their way mid-morning on Saturday, and the icing on the cake is that he has a pond on his farm, and Abraham catches a 19-inch catfish. (laughs) Now, if God can manage a farmer on the scene who happens to be a Christian and a Baptist to boot... (laughs) and an aviation mechanic, and an open home, and a heart for the hurting, and a fish pond, he could have saved the radiator. And he didn't, because sustaining grace is not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our troubles and pain, and then in the darkness, is there to sustain. One of the young men in this church is going through such deep waters right now. We were talking, communicating by email this week about this. And he said at one point, you know, it would be easier if Jesus had not healed but had given Grace to be sustained without healing. And I said to him, among other things, that's exactly what Jesus did in 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul was given by the Lord through the hand of Satan a thorn in the flesh, which he cries out to be taken away. And Jesus says, no, I will not take it away. And then he says, my grace, my sustaining grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness, to which Paul then responds, and this is not easy. I do not glibly say this into the face of hurting people. I let hurting people say it to hurting people. So Paul, the hurting one, says... Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses and insults and distresses and persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Not grace to bar what is not bliss, nor flight from all distress, but this, the grace that orders our troubles and pain and then in the darkness is there to sustain. One more illustration. Let's go back a little ways. March 16, Monday, 1885. Picture it now. You drive one block that way to 12th. On 7th, take a right, and as you stop before you get to 6th Street, 
On your left is the Douglas Company, and there is where Bethlehem Church was built first in 1872. They were founded in 71. I think the church was built in the next year or two. So we're talking now 14-year-old church, 1885, Monday, it catches fire. And it is ruined, totally. Bethlehem, First Swedish Baptist Church, just two blocks that way. The firemen come and they're up on the roof, doing their best to save the building. Like a lot of church burnings that we're very irate about right now. Um, and it's ruined and there is no recovery. Now, when they met down on Washington Avenue the next Sunday to celebrate God's sustaining grace, one of the graces they sustained or praised and celebrated was that the one part of the roof where the firemen were standing is the only part of the roof that did not collapse. And not only that, Within six weeks, May 1st, 1885, that building connected to this one was purchased for $13,500. And they had a better building, a bigger building from the Second Congregational Church than the first one they had within six weeks after that one burned down. If God can hold up the roof on which the firemen are standing and providentially save every life and put things together such that a better church is in hand for the ministry after the fire than before the fire, then he could have stopped the fire. But not grace that hinders and blocks and restrains what is not bliss, but rather grace that orders our pain, and then in the darkness is there to sustain. This text, Jeremiah 32, is about sustaining grace. And the reason I'm putting it in this context of darkness is because that's the context. The people are in exile, and it's dark, and God did it. Look at verse 36. Now therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel concerning this city, of which you say it is given into the hand of the king of Babylon by sword, by famine, and by pestilence. That's right. That's right. What they say, what they say is right. That came to pass. Sword, famine, pestilence. Grace did not spare the people of God. That. Well, what they say is not the last word. You say that, but God will have the last word, and he takes it in verse 37. Behold, I will gather them out of the lands to which I have driven them. There you see it. God did this. I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath, and in my indignation. I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. So God did it. They say, Oh, pain, oh, distress, oh, famine, oh, pestilence. And God says, yes, that's true. Darkness surrounds you. But I'm coming in, and I'm going to sustain, and I'm going to bring them back. I have driven them, and I will save. In other words, sovereign grace is going to triumph. Sovereign grace is going to triumph. Now, the question I pose this morning and want to answer is this. How can we be sure? How can you be sure where you are in your life? And how can we be sure as a church that sovereign grace is going to triumph? That grace that sustains will triumph in the coming years. Back then, the people of God were carried away into exile and many were lost in their unbelief. How can we be sure that we will triumph today? Now, the answer to this text is that sustaining grace is sovereign grace. Sustaining grace is, if you don't know that word, sovereign, omnipotent, all-powerful, 
grace. Grace that overcomes all obstacles. Grace that perseveres and preserves the faith and holiness of God's people so that we are what we must be to persevere into heaven. Saints have always prayed a great hymn. Let me quote it for you and ask if you think this is the way we should pray. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a what? Fetter. What's that? What's another word for it? Chain. Let thy goodness like a chain bind my sinful, wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O oh God, and what? It? Seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Do you pray like that? Do you give God that right? Chain me. I do. Because if he didn't seal me and chain me, I would leave him. John Piper would leave him. There's no doubt in my mind that I'd leave him if he didn't chain me to himself. That's what sustaining sovereign grace is, and that's what this text is all about. Pray, keep me, preserve me, defeat every rebellion that rises in me, overcome every niggling doubt in my mind and heart, deliver me from every destructive temptation, nullify every fatal argument that rises up in my mind, expose every demonic deception that lobs over here from the Satanists who meet across the street right now praying against this service. Shape me, incline me, hold me, master me. Do whatever you must do to keep John Piper believing. That's the way I pray. And that's the only reason I'm here. And I believe that's the only reason this church is here. And I invite you to enjoy and to lay yourselves open to sovereign Grace. This text is about new covenant promises of sustaining sovereign grace. Now, I'm going to read the key verses again and make some closing comments. But know this. There are scarcely any ethnic Jews in this room. If you are here, I'm thrilled that you are here. And uh, this promise was made to Jews originally. It is not restricted to Jews for this reason. It is the new covenant. I will make with you a new covenant. This is the covenant according to Luke 20:22 20, that Jesus Christ sealed with his blood for all who are in him and are therefore true children of Abraham. If you're a Christian this morning, you're a Jew. You have been grafted into the rich root of the olive tree, the covenant with Abraham. And therefore, all the promises that are flowing up from texts like this are flowing to Gentiles. There's the mystery. There's the wonder of the gospel. By faith alone, we become heirs of the promises made, like this promise, to Abraham. So when I read this, don't say, oh, that was for Jerusalem. Or that was for Jews. You non-Jews like me, by faith, are now children of Abraham by faith. Galatians 3, 7. So let's read it. Look at verse 38 to 41 and revel in these promises. They shall be, God says, my people, and I will be their God. I will give them one heart. And one way that they may fear me always for their own good and the good of their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. What is it? What's the promise? What's the covenant? That I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. And I will rejoice over them to do them good with all my heart, or I will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart, 
and with all my soul. I love that promise. That is one magnificent promise of sustaining sovereign grace. Let me mention four things very briefly. Number one, God promises to be our God. Verse 38, they will be my people and I will be their God. That means that everything that God is, all his omnipotence, all his wisdom and all his love is devoted to keeping you his people. I will be their God. And in this context, that means you're going to be my people. When I set my godness into action to make you my people and me your God, it's going to be done. Observation number two, second promise. God promises to change our hearts and cause us to love and fear him. To change our hearts and cause us to fear him. Verse 39 I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me always. Or at the end of verse 40, I will put the fear of me in their hearts. In other words, God does not simply stand by to see whether we will fear him. Hmm, I wonder if they're going to fear me. I wonder if my people will fear me. Well, if they choose to fear me by their own free, unaided will, then they'll be my people. That is not the way God works. He will sovereignly, supremely, mercifully give us a heart and a way and put the fear of him in our hearts. That is sovereign, sustaining grace. If you're a Christian this morning, that's why you're a Christian. And oh, that you would give God the glory the way he deserves. Third observation. God promises that he will not turn away from us. And, get this, he promises that we will not turn away from him. Verse 40. I will make an everlasting covenant with them and one, I will not turn away from them to do them good. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts. So number two, they will not turn away from me. That is sovereign, sustaining, keeping, persevering grace for all of God's chosen people. That's what's new about the new covenant. The old covenant put out the commands and did not give that sovereign, sustaining, preserving grace. And the new covenant does. God promises, in other words, to fulfill the conditions that he commands that we fulfill. He will see to it that faith and love and fear abound in his people and bring them to glory. Finally, number four, God promises to do this with the greatest intensity imaginable. I think this is why I love this text so much, because it ends in verse 41 on such an incredible note. I hope not incredible for you. I will rejoice over them. Now picture a happy God here. Can you picture God rejoicing or does God only frown in your imagination? God's always stern. God's always tough. Is that your God? Please, Holy Spirit, work this now. And I will rejoice over them to do them good. And I will plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. In other words, this sovereign, sustaining grace is coming to us this morning with the greatest intensity imaginable. I chose that phrase real carefully. This is not a sermonic flourish here at the end. This is not a rhetorical device. I want to challenge you as rationally and as 
plainly as I can with this challenge. You are not able, and you may come to me after the service if I'm wrong, you are not able to even conceive of an intensity of desire and joy greater than the intensity in this verse with which sovereign grace is coming to you. Now, here's the reason I say that. Suppose we took all the intensity for food, sex, fame, power. What do people love? What what do they want? You, You could add the list. Just all the desires that drive the human heart. Desires and joys and take it all. Then take all six billion people in the world, give or take. Take them all. Take all that desire and all those people and put it in a container and measure it to this desire. I will rejoice over them with all my heart and all my soul. Now you've got it in a container and you're comparing it with that. What do they look like? They look like a thimble compared to the Pacific Ocean. For a simple reason, which is why I know this challenge will go undefeated. God is infinite. Humans are finite. It doesn't matter how many humans you've got. Take six billion, billion, billion and add up their desires and put them in a container and compare them to this word. All my infinite heart and all my infinite soul energizing my will to rejoice over doing you good. And if that doesn't take your breath away, you need to pray. Open my eyes. This kind of promise, and there are many in the Bible like this, should simply take our breath away. God Almighty, with a massive, glorious, beautiful smile upon his face towards the likes of us, these people who are prone to wander, Lord, we feel it, and have to have sovereign grace to keep us in his fellowship. These people he smiles upon, he gets up on his tiptoes, and he cannot wait to do us good with all of his heart and all of his soul. What does it say? In Second Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself powerful on behalf of those whose heart is whole towards him. He can't wait to find another opportunity to work for you. And the only reason he withholds is because he's got more to do another way or because you are not trusting and he's going to wait until you're in a better position for it. Some of you, I'm done, I'm going to close now. Some of you are being allured by this grace for the first time right now. Some of you are hearing the message of sovereign, sustaining, joyful grace for the first time and being drawn. You know what that is? That's God. That's the Holy Spirit right now. If, if what I have said feels like if that were true, I would love that kind of a God. That feeling in your heart is given by God. And I simply invite that group of people to yield right now. Just yield. Just say, do it. Have me. Take me. Master me, rule me, love me like that. I quit resisting. That's called conversion. There's a lot more people who've lived in this grace for a long, long time. You love it. You're just sitting there saying, yes, that's where I live. That's my life. And you're ready to sing, which is what we're going to do. So whether you are moving in for the first time, or whether you've been here and been in the grace wherever you worship a long time, we want to sing. We want to bless God with this closing song.